say hey everyone uh let's see i'm not muted and uh we are good to go i am in my apartment in manhattan and uh that's probably why you're seeing uh so much light behind me it's actually a bunch of windows but uh in order to see me um the aperture has to be i guess remain kind of small and uh so hopefully you guys can hear me and uh let me know if you can let me know uh where you're uh, watching from, and if this is the first live stream, or if you've been on lots of them. Now, in addition to that, I would love to go back and forth with you guys a little bit um, as we talk about learning. And what I want to do is actually, I want to do several live streams about really a different approach to learning, a different approach to how you manage the knowledge that you come across so that you bring it with you into your future so that you consistently get better and better uh in order to do that though i really want to get a sense of what most people are currently doing if they're doing anything at all uh what what that looks like whether they're reading books and if so are they taking notes on those books and if they're taking notes what happens to those notes are they going through programs if they are going through programs are they taking notes on those and what happens to those notes so I'm curious, like, um, what, where you guys are, what you guys do to learn, and really, where do you see learning fit in in your life? Because to me, it's a major part. I know uh, for many people, it's not of the same level of importance. So we're going to be talking about learning strategies. I'm going to tell you about some of the learning strategies that I've uh, developed for myself over the years. Um, did a video over a decade ago on YouTube about um, my learning strategy or how I read, and uh, that's evolved over time, but uh, that became quite popular. And so I want to talk to you about learning, and it's been a vital part of uh, my success for sure, and I hope it is for you after we're done. So um, let's take a look at who is on. And, uh, good afternoon, Don. Um, Hello, Dottie. I'm going to change the way these look a little bit. Maybe make these a little bit bigger. Let's see. Um, and cool. Glad that you're loving uh, this month's Steal Our Winners. And uh, hi, Isabel. Hello. <laughs> uh, Don from Columbus. Uh, Marco from Finland. And uh, Craig from Dune Din, Florida. Uh, Dottie Berry creating a course. I try to learn constantly. Uh, Andrew, love these, been on a bunch of these. Cool. Greetings from Serbia. Good to see you, Milos. Uh, greetings from Venezuela. Uh, very cool. Uh, and Cora Imparo and Deborah. Hey, all right. So, um, yeah, so do you guys, do you read, what is it? I guess I'm curious, and I, and I recognize the fact that most times when people come to these live streams, they really more so want to just passively listen. Um, but I'm curious as to do you do you learn in a formal way or is it haphazard? And um, and then what do you do? Uh, I'm curious um, so that I can kind of change what I plan on presenting in addition to. Uh, knowing what to present. So, okay, so uh, I guess I'll start at uh, really the evolution of my process. And uh, hey, Isabella, and uh, we can go from there. Uh, but very curious about, I have a lot to share about. That. And uh, without knowing so much about where you're coming to it from, it's it, it, I can't be as helpful as I'd like. So that's why uh, giving me info will be helpful. So by all means, share anything and everything as it relates to your learning. So uh, what I realized early on was, um, let's see, uh, that I, I, I recognized very early in life, right, that if I could read faster, I, that would be a distinct advantage. And so I went and took a couple of uh, speed reading classes when I was much younger. Uh, my senior year, I think in high school, early college, but uh, I never, had the discipline to stick with it. And so even though uh, I, I went through a course on speed reading, I never really sped read because in or it's a skill. And in order for that skill to stick, it really requires quite an intense amount of, 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 uh, of practice. Now, 
having said that, even though I didn't uh, learn how to speed read early on, uh, in college, I did get uh, a Radio Shack uh, cassette player and recorder that was variable speed and variable pitch. So I could actually um, record uh, lectures in regular time and then listen to them at high speed. And I certainly did that quite a bit. Then when computer files started to become more popular, um, I took a lot of cassettes and played it high speed and recorded it onto my computer as MP3 so I could listen in high speed. And so I was already listening in high speed pretty early on, but, uh, and I'll go back to that. Um, but I still wasn't really reading um, that fast. And uh, when I did read, though, I read a lot and, uh, and I would highlight um, and I'd highlight a lot. And even though I have like a pretty crappy memory, for whatever reason, I can remember where, where I read something, what side of the page it was on, stuff like that, weird stuff. And um, so I'm just trying to think which came first, which came second. Uh, at some point. Yeah, I don't know which came first or which came second, but at some point um, I went to go get a book out of my library that I had read, um, looking for where I'd highlighted something because I knew kind of where it was at. And I must have bought a cheap highlighter for highlighting that because when I went back to that book, uh, the highlights were faded. And that made me really scared because uh, I had read so many books over the years and highlighted them as a way of them being able to go back to them that if the highlights disappeared i'd have to reread the book and so i decided right then and there that i was gonna have to do something about it and what we ended up doing for it was uh getting a guillotine at the office and i would read hardcover books i'd bring them into the office and we would actually check the binding with the guillotine and then we would scan the whole book in and then that book would be sent to the philippines and they would cut and paste everything I highlighted into a separate document. And that would become a PDF and a Word doc. And over time, it became other things, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so, so anyway, so that happened on that front. And I, I don't really remember the timing of these two different things. I think they happened around the same time. Um, Maria Andros, who has a different name now, um, she bought me a uh, iPad. And uh, I hadn't bought an iPad for myself because I didn't really see the value in it. I had a, an iPhone and I had a Mac Air. And so this new item I didn't really appreciate. And so I didn't get one. And then Maria Andros bought me an iPad. And as I was playing around with some of the software that was available for the iPad, one of the pieces of software that I came across was a program called Quick Reader. So Q-U-I-C-K-R-E-A-D-E-R. -E -E okay. So what Quick Reader is, is an app that allows you to upload EPUBs into it. And it allows you to practice speed reading. And what I mean by that is, is that it, allow, it enables you to do those drills that I didn't do when I was younger, you know, pushing yourself to go at certain speeds and going faster and faster and faster. So that software, that app, that $5 app, Quick Reader, was a game changer for me. Now, before I even go further into that, one of the things that I, I'm, what we're talking about right now is speed reading and speed listening and speed watching, right? All of these kind of fall under the umbrella of being able to input more faster, right? And, um, and so we're taking a look at this. And one of the reasons why this is important is, is that with so much information coming at us every day, our ability to be efficient and extracting what is useful for us is extremely important. And most people, while they don't, I would, what I would guess is, is that while many people have the experience of listening at higher speed or watching at higher speed, they don't have uh, the experience of reading at a higher speed. And one of the things that's really interesting is, is that uh, while reading takes longer to master than watching or listening at, at a faster speed, um, we've all had the experience of driving in a car really fast, slowing down to the speed limit and having it feel slow. You can do that with audio and video, too, where you go faster than you normally would go. And then when you drop it down, it sounds like it's going slower, even though it might be faster than what you're used to. 
reading, unfortunately, you, you're doing the same thing, but it will not be as noticeable in the beginning. So, um, in other words, like you don't, you know, when you want to increase your ability to listen to something and have it make sense, let's say you can normally go one and a half times speed at two times speed. It sounds like chipmunks to you. If you go at two and a half times speed and keep it there for three minutes and then back it down to two minutes to two times speed, it will actually feel slow. The, it takes a little bit longer than, than that when it comes to doing it with reading. So, all right. Um, so I got this app called Quick Reader and what I started to do, so there's a couple things as it relates to speed reading that are useful to know, okay? And one of the things is, is that you do not have to say the words in your head to understand what it means. And that's called subvocalization. You need to pass subvocalization because we can only speak at a, at a fast, at a certain rate. Above that, you could read a lot faster than you could speak. So there was a time when you were learning how to read where you had to sound out each letter to understand the word. Now you don't need to do that. You can just look at the word and know the word. And now we're taking it up a notch where you're looking at groups of words. And you don't have to say them in your head to understand them. So subvocalization. Now there's two easy ways to overcome subvocalization. You can either put a pencil in your mouth like this, right, while you're reading, or you can chew gum, which is one of the reasons why I consistently chew gum. Um, as long as your mouth's occupied, you can't be making out the motions of what saying the words would be. So that's first, right? And that you, you have to overcome some vocalization and ideally, right, that when you're learning the skill of reading fast, you are not also trying to comprehend at the same time. You have to train your eyes to go faster first, then train your brain to go faster, and then finally you can now read and comprehend at that higher speed. So what I used to do was I would go into, I would, I would turn with a program called Calibre, which is a free program. Um, all right, I'm just looking to see, make sure my sound is good. It looks like it is. Um, I would I would use a pro free program called Calibre, and I would take all the, the notes from the highlights of the books that I had, right, um, that were going over to the Philippines, getting, you know, uh, chopped and everything, and I would put that in quick reader. Now, that's a really important point. Because I wanted to train myself to be able to read faster, I could not do that with new material. And I couldn't do that with material that I didn't understand. I needed it to do it with material I was somewhat familiar with. So when I started with Quick Reader, I was loading up the highlights that had been extracted for me. Now, another reason why I extracted the highlights, which might be useful for people to know about, although it's now coming more full circle, is that I would then also take the PDFs of everything I've highlighted from every book, and that goes in a special folder of all the books I've read. So when I want to do a, when I want to come, when I want to review everything I've read about a certain thing, I can do a search in that folder, and then I'd find all the PDFs that had that word in it, etc. And I can then use that for making a course or a presentation or what have you. Okay. So anyway, so I loaded up these PDFs into Quick Reader, and I would start at like I think. Uh, where did I start? I would start at a thousand words a minute, which was much faster than what I could really comprehend. Read that for, you know, a couple minutes, then go to 2000 words a minute for maybe two minutes and a 4000 words a minute. And at 4000 words a minute, I'm not comprehending anything, but I'm training my eyes to move as fast as the, as the, um, as the cursor is, because the cursor is highlighting the amount of words and at the speed that you want it to go. Right. So I'd go a thousand, two thousand, four thousand. And then I would back it down to what I could comfortably read at, but pushing myself. So in the beginning, you know, that was 500. Then it was 750. Then it was a thousand. And over time, I was able to get my reading speed up to about 2000 words a minute. So that used to be my reading process. I would actually read books offline, highlight them, have my office take what I highlighted, turn that into a digital document. That digital document would then be turned into an EPUB and I would practice speed reading in Quick Reader, the ability to be able to process it. And what was really cool was that 
you know, oftentimes I would be going through my highlights of a book relatively fast. It might take 10 minutes to go through everything I highlighted from a specific book. So what I found was, is I could also do like a topic dive where like if I had a day where I was going to be working on copy, I would review all the books in quick reader on copywriting and, you know, going at different speeds and learning to move my eyes faster and comprehend faster. And the, and so that was my process, right? And then I'd have those PDFs in binders and I used to have binders all around me of all the books, all the highlights of all the books. Um, and uh, I would review those from time to time. And so, uh, you know, outside of quick reader, but also inside of quick reader pretty significantly so. And so that was the process, so to speak. Um, then after that, the next thing I added um, was uh, audio. And what I would do is I had a program called, and I still have it, called Say It. Um, and Say It was costing me like four or five bucks. And what it will allow you to do is you can upload a, a text file and, it, and output an MP3. So it turns any text into a pre-recorded MP3. And so I would take my all the highlights and I would also uh, make an audio version of that and listen to it in the background at high speed. So that became my reading process for some time. And that was responsible for me to really grow my reading speed from several hundred words a minute to about 2,000 words. And that process kind of stayed in place for several years. I wrote, I created that video on YouTube that a bunch of people have seen. And, um, oh, I left out that. So let me take a step back from that. Then I want to interact with you guys a little bit. Then we have more to share. One of the things I found is that um, with my ADD, right, that the faster I have to take content, whether that's video, audio, or written, and I have to speed it up to the for me to be at my best. Um, I have to speed it up to the point where I need to completely focus on it. Because at regular speed, I generally tend, my mind wanders. And, um, and so I don't maximize the learning. So, but when I speed things up, it gets to a certain point where I have to pay complete attention. And it's that complete attention and enjoy that feeling, but I also learn more at that and I'm more efficient with my time. What I found was is that speed reading on the elliptical made time go by faster than anything else, even faster than a movie, et cetera, because I was so like dived into the content, really concentrating on being able to move my eyes faster and being able to summarize what I was seeing. And so that made exercising easier. It also, I was using my body more. Jay Abraham bought me an oxygen machine that he was using for Q and A calls. And I decided to use it with, uh, with my reading and exercise. So every day I'd get on the elliptical and I would speed read for an hour. It'd make time go by really fast and I'd be improving my reading speed as well as becoming more familiar with certain concepts. And so that was kind of the, the way I went about it. I've added a lot more to it since then and I wanna tell you more about that, but I figured let me go to uh, the comments here for a second and see where we're at. Um, all right, Isabella from Germany, read every day, but don't always take notes. Brain is always seeking structure. Hector from Panama, good to see you. Isabella is a copywriter. I learn by consuming and then teaching through visual models. Interesting. Uh, reading books, your stuff, listening to steel, I wanted to take notes and trying to put them in my game plan. Got it. I read constantly and mainly use sticky notes to mark important stuff. Wish I had a more formal process. Read daily called Hot Tub Reading, where my wife reads books out loud and we discuss. Oh, that's kind of cool. Readings from Germany. Also take online classes. Application is the key to true learning. It's what we do with the information that brings accommodations. True. Uh, typically, I learn the guiding principles and rules on subject, and then I look for micro opportunities throughout the day to test those principles. Copywriting, for example, I'm always leaving. Whoops. Uh, whoa. That's too big. Um, that's too small uh through the lens of just everyday normal bland conversations that's interesting um hey guys thanks rich amazing info 
Five awesomeness, true. Yes, I used to be able to do speed reading when I was speed reading when I was in school, but I have a hard time doing it now. I could read a page as fast as you could run your hand over in school. Now it's touch and go. I have to be in the right frame of mind. But yeah, it's certainly almost all audio. I read at 2x because of your suggestions. Cool. I always wonder how to consume the important parts of books and reports without having to consume all of it. Okay. I took Evelyn Wood's speeding reading course many years ago. It was allegedly a lifetime measurement. Do you think the app for it? Yeah, I do. I mean, it's all about practice. Anyone else lose sound? Sound is good. No. Um, learning how to learn is an overlooked skill and so necessary now as rapid change in the world speeds up and we need to learn how to do it faster in less time, but where it actually gets into our subconscious. I like the idea of learning while in motion exercises, the endorphins leads. Yep. Is this what you had in mind when reading on the treadmill? Uh, on the elliptical? Yeah, it certainly is. Um, it helps the mind. It helps your learning. It just uh, that the re all the research shows that. Um, not sure what would be the best alternative if you can't speed read. I guess list high speed listening, but it also depends on what modality. Um, got it. All right. Uh, Yes. Yeah, so Ryan says he totally, he has ADHD, so he totally understands the speed thing. Life just moves way too slow. Yep. I agree. Can we get a list of tools that you were suggesting? Some of them got missed. We'll go over those. I'm an aggressive highlighter and have systems of symbols that designate the importance of key points. Then we read those highlights and integrate the important points, always pulling off shelves and reading highlights based on my symbols. Cool. All right. So, so, so far we've talked about, um, you know, using Quick Reader, an app on the iPad, um, to review things that you've highlighted or notes that you have that you're not that worried about getting, so that you can go faster and faster and faster, and then over time, what happens is your baseline goes faster and faster, and so you're increasing your reading speed. All right, so the next thing that I, the next app that then kind of, and we talked about putting stuff, right, reading it, having it converted into some kind of electronic text, right? My highlights, having that be turned into a PDF, an EPUB, a Word doc, and then also using a program like Say It to turn it into an audio. Okay, so the next thing, the next tool I got or next app that really made a difference to my learning process or workflow, you could say, is a, another uh, iPad app called um, Voice Dream. D R E A M voice dream. Oh, I, you know, what? I didn't put up our, uh, our Facebook group. All right, let's do that. Um, voice dream. And what voice dream does is it allows you to, what it does is it'll take an EPUB or PDF and it will read it to you while it's also showing on the screen, the cursor. And so, this allows you now the fastest quick reader no the fastest voice dream can go because it's reading to you is i think 670 words a minute at between 600 to 670 words a minute you can generally go through a hardcover bookstore book 250 pages in about two and two to two and a half hours and so generally nowadays what i do is I spend the majority of my time, I still speed read sometimes, try to do it once or twice a week on the elliptical, but what I do is I use voice stream to go through current books and you know go through them in about two days. So every two days or so, I'm reading a new book on the elliptical. Now, some books that I read on the elliptical, I never read again, that's it. Like I just read on the elliptical, two hours, I'm done. If it's something that I feel is like a powerful book, there's more for me to get from it. Uh, then I read it as I normally do. But these days I tend to read more digital books. So I read it in an app called Good Reader, G-O-O-D-R-E-A-D-E-R, because it allows me to mark up PDFs and stuff very easily and, you know, highlight stuff. And with the Apple pen, it's, it becomes like I can go through it really fast. And if I can go through the book, Soon after I just went through it on the elliptical, all the better, because then I can get through it extremely fast. So now, like I've gone through Goodreader, 
right? And I've highlighted the book. So I'm not taking it to the office anymore. It doesn't need to be put in the guillotine, et cetera. Um, I can now just send myself a copy of the um, PDF that I've now highlighted. You can also send yourself all of the highlights, but it's got notation. I then, uh, I then take the, the PDF that I highlighted and I use a program called SumNotes, S-U-M-N-O-T-E-S, SumNotes.com. And what some notes will do is allow me to upload. I have an account, I think it was like 30 bucks a year where I can upload a PDF I highlighted and then tell, extract all the highlights and I can extract them as send them to Evernote, send them to a Word doc, send them to a text doc. And so I generally send it to a text doc and then I take that text doc and I save it as a PDF and a Word doc. But then I also now upload it into Evernote. So now I have all the highlights in Evernote, still goes into a uh, quick reader for me to practice speed reading. It still becomes an audio, but now it also goes into quick reader. And in quick reader, I use what's called progressive summarization. And now I am going through that, those notes several times, but I will hold off on that, kind of go back to what, the conversation that we've been having. And let me first ask you, is everything that I've shared so far clear? And um, in addition to that, have any questions come up for you as I'm kind of walking you through this process about what I've said so far? Uh, let me know so that we can turn this more into a conversation as opposed to a monologue. Um, as always, you're more than, uh, more than happy if you invite friends to come and watch with us and uh, and share with me where, how your learning strategy differentiates from mine, and then maybe we can have an interesting conversation. So, all right, so I've shared quite a bit with you, and what, I, what I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit more about the progressive summarization, um, but, uh, but before going further, I wanted to kind of see where, where you're at. Now there is somewhere, like if you type in Rich Chef and Reading Process, you'll see that first version, it's about a 20 minute video or something like that, um, of that on YouTube. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see, all right, cool. All right, uh, Greg needs a PDF of the process. Uh, Fritz is making notes like crazy, clear and very valuable. Uh, what I, when I learned French, I played the 2000 most used phrases in an audio format right before I slept and I woke up, perhaps there's a way to, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, this is a good question. Rich, can't you do some of the things you mentioned in Kindle? Yes, you can. Um, I just don't, and I generally don't buy my books, uh, from Amazon. So, uh, but there are a lot of benefits to doing it. I like using Goodreader as opposed to the Kindle app. Uh, so generally, even when I buy a book through Amazon, I break the, the you know, the protection so that I can read it in Goodreader. Um, but all of these are nice to, um, all of these are nice to, uh, all of the, most of this stuff can be easily done with Kindle, actually sometimes easier. Okay, so these are some interesting questions. Okay. Uh, how is your retention over time and have you found ways to improve that? All right, well, so this starts us down a, a path like of what is it that, what's your goal in learning the information? And this is kind of brings us back to what we were talking about in the last live stream as far as your future self. Right? Who do you need to be going forward um, to maximize your chances of success? And how can you learn your way to being that person? And, and so I, uh, I, what I want to be, I want to be careful in the way I, I, I word this time. Um, Uh, 
I, I try not to learn useless facts. That's first on. In other words, anything that can be looked up, I don't see the reason to know the intricate details of. Um, and so recall versus familiarity or um, I forget what the other is that's recognition. I, I study more for recognition than I do recall. So that's first. But what, what I found is, is that um, by having what allows me for what allows me to retain um, information is primarily summarization. And there is a there's when it comes to your ability to recall, there's really two primary vehicles to use when interacting with information of any type, right? So one is summarization, summarizing what you just covered, right? If you have a two minute conversation with someone, could you summarize that in one sentence? If you read two pages, could you summarize those two pages in one sentence? Your ability to summarize is a skill and it can be improved with practice. And part of retention is the ability to summarize. So you can practice that, you can practice that with everything and you will get very good at remembering also your information. Um, so there's the, there's the summarization, re-articulation in your own words kind of thing, okay? Um, the other is uh, spaced repetition. That um, and with spaced repetition, that's really more about taking something from short term memory and turning it into long term memory. And how do we do that? Well, I don't put myself out there as an expert on these things, but I've read a lot. And um, one of the one of the best tools for remembering is almost forgetting. And what I mean by that is, is that. Um, when you have almost forgotten something, that's when you want to try and remember it. It is that uh, it is that um, tension between not being able to remember and remembering that actually seals the content in. And so reviewing, but not reviewing too soon, allowing yourself to somewhat forget and then pull it back in is actually um, some of the best ways to remember. Uh, I don't have a specific strategy, though, Don, as far as remembering, except that what I have found is, is that the more times I interact with something, the more mastery and knowledge I have of it. So in this newer version, right, where I'm first going through the whole book uh, in voice stream, right, it takes two hours. Now I go through the whole book and highlight it. That happens relatively fast, it takes more than two hours because I'm highlighting. But now I've read the book a second time, right? Now everything I've highlighted goes into Evernote. And now I'm going to interact with that several times if, you know, when the time arises. And so I will be consistently interacting with that material. And that's what's going to lock it into my brain over time. Uh, Chris, uh, I have to reconnect with you. As you're ingesting the books, are you targeting one specific topic or are you reading things that interest you, but all unrelated to each other? Good question. I do both. Um, so there are times when I am trying to understand a new topic, right? And then if I'm doing that, I'm, I'm, I might be hitting a lot of different sources for the same type of information. Uh, sometimes I'm just pursuing what interests me. And, uh, and then other times it's because it was recommended by, you know, someone or something. So I'm, and I'm constantly reading several books at the same time. Um, I don't know. I think that makes it easier for me. I'm not sure why. Uh, cool. Very cool, Teresa. Um, oh, that's cool. Uh, Microsoft Word can also read the docs to you. Uh, great question. All right. Um, cool. All right. So, so interacting with it certainly helps. So now the What I learned, the reason I go now, and instead of just putting it into Quick Reader or just putting it into my iPad, the reason it goes into Evernote is because I learned a process uh, from Tiago Fort called progressive summarization. And what I would say even before going into this is that is to recognize that 
everything we do nowadays involves information and we are surrounded by information. Information is coming at us at faster and faster speeds. And so it's my belief and, you know, try it on, see if it fits for you, that your ability to manage, process, uh, strip out value, um, and, and make and leverage knowledge and information will be a big difference between those who succeed and those who don't. And so your ability to thrive in a high information, dense information reality um, is somewhat predicated on your ability to process, right? And so um, in regards to that, being a better knowledge worker, one of the things is being able to input information very quickly, right? Being able to um, also have, that's one part, right? Like you could say, you could say knowing what it is you need, that's an important part. Being able to get that information into you quickly, that's another important part. And then what do you leave over for your future self, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, um, our knowledge is an accumulation of everything that we've come across, right? And if it's true that most of us will change careers numerous times, will have to do learn numerous skills, then having something to take along with us that that are the best ideas we've come across, our best thoughts about those ideas would be very valuable. And so, um, so this process that Tiago talks about, or what I've learned from him, is called progressive summarization. And the idea is is to take notes in a way that. Um, is opportunistic. In other words, like you're doing it when you need it. And doing it in a way where there's artifacts left, there's evidence left, so that your future self can see how much time you've invested in the note, what the biggest ideas are of the note, and you know what's the most important parts of it, etc. Right? So in any kind of movement of information, there is a trade-off between two elements. There is the trade-off between compression, right? How much we compress in the information. Uh, and Tiago uses the word context. I think there's a better word to use for this, but we'll use Tiago's word for now, context, right? The more context there is, the less compressed it is, right? And the more compressed it is, the less context there is. And you know, we're very good at compressing, but then in the future, we might not understand what that compression was about and we lose a lot of good information. So Tiago had this thought of progressive summarization where each time that you interact with a note um, for a project, you are taking that note one step further and you are progressively summarizing. And based on that, anytime you look at a note, you can see how many times it's been touched and also what the big ideas are and what you've already determined are the big ideas. So progressive summarization is a process where you are taking multiple passes through. So I take my book note, right? The highlights from a book, it goes into Evernote. And then from Evernote, what I do is the very first time I read through that whole, all the highlights, I will then bold anything that is more important than the rest, right? So I will bold certain parts of the highlights that I've now taken out of this book. The next time through, I will highlight any parts of the bold that are even more important, right? So I, everything's important. That's why I came from the book into Evernote. First time I go through, I bold what's important. The next time through, I'm only looking now at the bold parts and I'm highlighting anything that's super important. Then I will go through it another time, if I'm going through it another time, and I will take everything that I've highlighted, move it up to the table, copy and paste it, and now I'll begin writing my own stuff, my own thoughts about that, and then some I will actually completely rewrite. So all my notes are, like from my books, but all my notes follow this process of this progressive summarization. And the idea is, is that I am very aware that my future self is going to make the easiest decision, not the best decision, the easiest decision. 
So my notes need to be structured in a way where it takes no time to understand what it's about by looking at what's been highlighted and, um, and whether this fits in whatever future self is working on. So that now has become another step in my book reading process, the progressive summarization. So let's now see, um, let's see what questions we have here. Okay. I can say that I'll listen to a book about seven times on average before I pick up the physical book and then the trigger my memory to be like, oh, okay, I remember this. Uh, then the books are so much easier. And then if the book is on a topic that I'm kind of already into, then I pick up on repeating lessons. Interesting. Okay. Getting emotionally involved helps with the stick and the impetus for behavioral changes. Sure. How do you deal with conflicting ideas or concepts? Situations as in our mind has made up a clear concept about something and then a 180 degree opposite conflicting idea. Um, you'd have to give me an example, Michael. I generally tend to like when there is some challenge um, or different way of uh, different ways of people seeing things. Um, so I tend to enjoy that. And a lot of times I will end up having a conversation with the author of the book. Um, let's just see if I can find something here to kind of show you. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, see if I can go to a different window for a second and uh see if i go yeah. all right so this these are my notes on um on tiago fort's book um that's not out yet um building a second brain and um Okay, what I wanted to show you, actually, and I'm going to do it this way here, whoops, is, uh, okay, I want to do it the other way. And then do this. All right. So as you can see here, and let's just make sure that this looks the way it's supposed to. Yeah, all right, cool. Okay. So as you can see here, right, like these are my highlights from the book, turning your ideas into reality, making a difference, right? The, like you can see that all of this was highlighted, right? But just uh, because like this came from, you know, my highlights of the book and then this is what I bolded and then of what I bolded, um, then I start making my thoughts, right? So here's something like this is, this is my notes on those few parts that I highlighted. Information is now the raw material of much of our daily reality. How you consume and manage the information flowing through your life is now one of the most decisive elements in your effectiveness. Okay, that's what he wrote. It's a profound thought. It's less about what you're exposed to than what is seen, distinctions, what is captured, Evernote, what is processed, build the second brain, and what is found when it's time to create. And unfortunately, it's not intuitive and it isn't something most people with knowledge are, are knowledgeable enough to create their own systems to start with. And it's an entirely new way of working. It's not just different or slightly better and therefore requires a shift in a few perspectives from the way you see your work and how to do your work to using your curiosities and what fascinates you to guide you on everything from content you consume to the outputs you create in your job, business and overall life. See, so like that's my note on that book. Now, obviously because I'm interacting with this thought, the idea that this thought will ever leave me is probably pretty slim. Right. So here's something else that I bolded. Right. Then it, you know, my thoughts on that. Right. Here's some more. Right. So, you know, I don't do this with every book, obviously, um, but with the ones that are really valuable, the ones where I'm getting a lot out of, I take the time to do that. Right. So hopefully that makes sense. Does that make sense to everyone? And can you see how that back and forth with the book? This is already a book that I can review in highlights and, you know, in my, in my speed reading thing. I have the audio version, but now my interacting with it 
my thoughts. I'm remixing it. Like I am now making it much more of my own. Does that make sense um, with you guys? All right. So, uh, so I really want to spend more time talking about the intentions of like what your intention should be around learning and then how do you leverage it for the most and, and what are the, what are the outputs of that learning? Um, but I would also, um, I would also ask you to how, and I, I, I'm curious how many of you think that um, if you could learn much faster and better, uh, that it would make a significant difference in your life. And if so, which I imagine many of you would agree with, um, what prevents you um, from, from taking it more seriously? Okay, so this is a good point. So Bruce says, I suppose the issue I have with this BYOB process, and it's BASB, <laughs> build a second brain. But, that, but that's just Tiago's thing, right? That's, and progressive summarization is part of that. But um, the, but there's a deeper, um, there's a deeper issue around this so it's regarding the time it takes. And that is, is that um, a lot of people end up reading on autopilot. They're just reading as a way of consuming time uh, and they become somewhat more knowledgeable, but that's about it. Um, you know, it's kind of like reading a ton of self-help books, but never doing any of the exercises in them. Um, you only get limited benefit. And so what I think, want to do is not just, I want to have a much deeper understanding of things. I want to understand the principles of things. And by understanding the principles, um, it's easier to pick up any skills or anything like that. Uh, and I want to do it in a way where I am consistently making life easier for my future self. I want to have my notes in a way that my future self can easily uh, access them, see them, be reminded of them. And I wanna do it in a way where the, where I'm optimizing for better ideas or power laws in a, in a market. And, um, and so when it comes to things like that, I believe that the, that what I want to have is the impact that doing long-term thinking and research can create, but I don't want my life to be all about that, which means that I need to have something that can capture stuff behind me so that at certain times I can come back and cuddle through that stuff and figure out new connections. Um, so, what I would also say though, is that I went from just uh, doing what I was doing uh, to actually using Evernote as my centralized place. And so now even the articles I read, I read them in Evernote, bold, highlight, do all that. And constantly, you know, going through those layers um, and pulling out like, key ideas that I can remix and come up with new thoughts. And that's really what, um, that's what I want to use what I go through, um, for myself. Right. So, um, so, you know, I,
I want to make it as easy as possible for my future self, right? That's the goal. And recognizing that my future self is, it makes the easy choice, not the best choice. Um, and because of that, I want to, or, you know, kind of what we were talking about, I think we talked about it even in the last live stream, that, uh, you know, because we tend to make the easy choice, not the best choice, we want to make it so that the best choice is the easiest choice. And so that's where you get into um, decision architecture and nudges where you take out the batteries out of your remote and, and put them in the kitchen. So if you want to turn on the television, you have to walk into the kitchen to get the batteries. It just makes the better choice easier because you're making the easier choice more difficult, which is not the best choice. So understanding that your future self is not going to be the best version of you, could be the worst version of you. How do you make life easy for that future self? And so with that thought in mind, right, um, I want to see you pull up something here if I can for you. Um, the that's funny chris um so we were talking about future self in the last live stream and uh let me just kind of go through some notes i had taken on future self in case we didn't cover them all last week uh the choices today shape the life of your future self if you could tell your past self something now what would it be so think about that for a second think about like that if you could go back two years and give yourself advice two years ago, what advice would you give yourself? And then based on that, think about where you wanna be in two years from now and what advice would you give yourself? Now, when it comes to thinking about becoming a future self, I like to put that closer than several years out. I think there's benefit to several years out, but I also think like, who do I wanna be in a month from now or two months from now and how do I be that, right? Like that is to me a more motivating uh, kind of goal. Okay, let's see. Uh, lately I've been taking it more seriously and I've been trying to find ways to learn faster and just information I need or I think will help me in the future to grow my business so I'm not wasting so much time on needless things. Okay, cool. That I appreciate that, Don. Thank you for sharing that. Whoa, okay. Ryan wrote a long post here. Just gotta make it smaller. All right. How do I make this smaller? All right. Um, I say ego from my own experience up to the start of 2009. I hated reading like Fahrenheit 457 level of hated, but I found the cure to be some of my biggest problems might be in books. So I forced myself to read. Once I found the answers I wanted, I wanted it became a dopamine rush for me and I got addicted. So I'm your case. How can you make learning a dopamine rush? Uh, okay. And then let's see. Uh, I'm with you 100%. I learned to understand and to apply so my future self can create new and be able to understand aspects, how they function together and make it more effective, whatever it might be. Very cool. All right. So we're on the same page. And um, okay. So we have this thought like in theory of constraints. Uh, well, I think I talked about this last week um, that, you know, when you're since we start with the problems, right? And we wanna find out what the root causes of those problems are, um, we're looking for problems, but we're not looking for any problems. We're looking for problems that relate to that business, right? So one of the ways that we do that is we create a picture of what this business would look like if it was finished perfect in every way, achieving its goal, blah, blah, blah. And then we look at that picture and we say, why isn't the business like that now? And now we come up with all the problems. Projects take longer to complete, this, that, the other, because it, by drawing out the system, we've kind of created the boundaries of the system. And so by creating the boundaries of the system, then we can say we we know where we know the location of the problems we want to isolate on. So I think that 
understanding who you are today and who you need to be in two months from now, six months from now, et cetera, and then using your learning plan to actually um, acquire those skills can be game changing. And so uh, there's a bunch of stuff that uh, that can kind of help you in that journey, you could say, right? So what are the key things for you to know in your industry and what micro skills are made up of that, right? So that um, there's a concept called the skill tree where you're, Big skills are made up of smaller skills, and so you can map out your skill development and what skills you need to get some kind of outcome, right? And so there's, you have to take it on like a project, right? Like putting it on project status, right? Getting yourself to this other level, and then seeing that your learning is actually bringing you, and probably, this is something that I need to do better even myself. The consistently summarizing is where there is tremendous power. Because the more you summarize, the more you lock in the information. The, uh, okay. Um, went over some of this stuff. I'd like to answer some questions as it relates to learning or growing your business. So by all means, um, chime in. Um, you know, we had some good ideas last week as far as using your future self as your accountability buddy. What does your future self look like? What do they need to know? What do they need to believe? What do they have to notice for? Uh, designing for your worst version of your, of your future self. Um, right. So, so those are some of the things as it relates to future self. The, all right. Okay, uh, this would definitely improve my performance dramatically. In my case, I haven't found a method of incorporating information that's easy to apply and I'm caught in the process of learning every day, but I don't spend enough time sharpening the sauce. I'm overwhelmed by the amount of information that I have to process, especially books, but also on videos and see that these books and courses are piling up. Got it. All right, so Omar, what? but what's the outcome you're trying to achieve, right? Like that, it has to start with that um, because the learning needs to be purpose. So, and we wanna make sure that it's not just intellectual entertainment. And the only way that we can know that for sure is to be very clear what we're trying to get out of whatever it is we're reading, watching, listening to. Uh, and then listening for that answer, summarizing for that answer, um, the, and recognizing that um, learning's a skill the more you do it, the better you get at it. The more skills you have, the easier it is to cross learn. Um, and so it increasingly becomes easier over time. Uh, you know, you should be, you should be thinking about the question, right? Like what if I learn this month would be a game changer for next month? Like what if I knew today would make my business totally different. And how can I know that in a month from now, two months from now? Um, what do I want to be able to do differently? What is it that I want to be able to do? Uh, what do I want to be? Um, what am I curious about? What would I like to understand? Right? And recognizing that ultimately what you want to be building is a workflow for learning. Right? And that it doesn't start with a complete workflow. It starts today recognizing you don't have one, right? That right now you haphazardly read books or do whatever. And recognizing that like every step of the process, the books that you, the input that you choose could probably be refined, right? How you get that information in could be improved upon. The notes you take could be improved upon. How you take action on said notes could be improved upon. And it's not all about improving it today. It's about slowly over time, making small changes to the way you do things so that you ultimately have a workflow, a learning workflow that works for you. Will mine work for you? Probably not. Uh, just like no one else's would work perfectly for me. Um, but by being exposed to mine, thinking about what your goals are, what you need to learn, how you learn best, what you enjoy doing, um, you can then start to craft your own workflow. 
And by doing so, as it relates to learning, if it becomes something that is, uh, one, something you enjoy, uh, and two, something that you do on a frequent basis, then what you're really doing is setting yourself up to kind of level up, right? And ultimately, that's what you want. You want to increasingly get better at dealing with uncertain environments. That's part of the entrepreneurial process, right? Dealing with uncertainty. And the way that you confidently deal with uncertainty is having confidence in your own abilities. And the way you have confidence in your own abilities is by consistently adding to your own abilities and adding to your own knowledge. Hence, right, like being an effective entrepreneur is meaning, part of it is being willing to know that you can handle whatever comes up and therefore to proceed in down the path of uncertainty because that's the entrepreneurial path right so um i would say that that could be helpful um i feel like i'm pontificating here so would love to get some more feedback uh, and it seems like there's a few here so that is cool and um I, I, I think there's an interesting question here. I haven't really thought about answering this, but uh, myself even yet, but I put it down here. Um, and the question is, there's two versions of it. Um, what is the most valuable output from my brain? What is, I'm not asking you to answer that for me, for you, right? What's the most valuable output from your brain? And where is the value created in your thinking? And can you optimize for it? So. What is the most valuable stuff that you come up with, right? As far as what the market pays, et cetera. And how can you actually create your workflow process, your learning workflow to support that, right? What is the, what is the most valuable thinking that you do? And how can you set up your, your learning workflow to support that type of thinking, right? So if, you know, I, I, one of my coaches once said to me, um, you know, maybe what you come like, because I was complaining about my productivity and I was don't remember the specific circumstances, but I was complaining about my productivity, not getting anything done or something. And my coach was like, maybe your job is just to come up with the million dollar ideas and everything that you're doing is so that you can do that. And if that's the case, then uh, that's something that, you know, you do well. And all of this other stuff is related to that. It's not about you're not doing anything. You're actually being highly productive. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's not, right? But the point of, of the matter is, is that if I really believe, right, that, that, that like my value, the most valuable stuff that my brain comes up with is the big ideas, right, then wouldn't it make sense to create my learning workflow and like how I take notes and everything, with all those things to set me up to come up with the most big ideas, right, um, to facilitate that process. And obviously someone who's kind of set up their workflow to support an outcome versus someone who hasn't, that person who's done the legwork is gonna have a huge advantage. So let's take a look at some of these questions. Um, hi Rich, what do you do with all your past notes and ideas after setting up your second brain process? What advice for processing and analyzing your notes from the past last 10 years? Well, so what's interesting is, is that like, <clears throat> I haven't been keeping a second brain for that long. It's only been about two years, but you know, I wrote all those reports over a decade ago and I wish I still had, I have all my notes from those reports. They're in, you know, uh, shoe case, um, uh, shoe boxes with lots of index cards. Um, but what I can tell you is, is that like, as I was thinking about this presentation and another presentation that I need to give, um, I'm able to pull up past presentations and my notes from those and what I thought was most important. So even though a project might be archived, some of that knowledge still uh, comes back in. And there's a lot of benefits to doing the progressive summarization that I haven't gotten into, um, such as being able to find any document based on the fact that everything is still there, even though you've compressed it and made it obvious what's most important. Um, so what I would say is is to uh, is to maintain it, right? I wish I I wish that I had one uh, one big Evernote that had like the last fifteen years worth of stuff. It would be so valuable to me. But I'm also still working out how to best use Evernote to support me, right? So I'm learning from Tiago, learning from others, 
But at the end of the day, I'm going to manipulate the environment so that it best supports how I learn and what I want to do with that. But understanding the thinking that you do that provides the most value and then optimizing your learning workflow for that, I think is very valuable. How much time each day do you spend on learning versus implementation? It feels like you can get focused on learning or overlearning instead of applying skills. Is it a fear of failure that might uphold implementation? Well, that's a great question, Margie. I mean, everyone is different, right? Um, so part of my job is thinking for a lot of people. So I see that as part of my job, but yes, certainly overlearning can be an excuse as to not creating, right? So the, you know, I learned to create. So I look at my ratio, right? Input to output. And I want to keep them uh, in homeostatic, homeostatic, right? Um, there are times when I get overly curious. And sometimes I got to pull myself a little bit back. But um, but yeah, certainly it's you bring up a good point, Margie. And um, for me, a lot of times playing with the ideas is part of the implementation, you know, trying to kind of come up with something bigger. Um, so my job is a little bit different, you could say, but like, you know, but uh, it's a very valid point uh, for sure. And I hope I'm answering it. After watching the Steel Our Winners post on framing and backward building your goals, starting backwards from where you want to be to build a plan to get there, any more tips in doing that or something I can read? or watch to help me be able to do a better job so I'm less likely to leave something important out that could lead to failure. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, what what like what's the goal of your business and what does it look like when it's finished? And then why isn't your business look like that now? Um, and you list the, like all the things you need. This is a little different than what I was saying before. This is a different process all the things you need, then put them in dependency order. What has to come first, second, third, and you know, that's just by comparing one to two, one to three, one to four, and say, in order to have this, I must have that. Is that true or not? And so you put them in order. And now you have in sequence what your business needs to accomplish in order to get to its outcome, right? And then you look at that and you ask yourself, what if I had to get there four times as fast? What if I had to do 10 times as much volume and start seeing if any of these can be moved around, but that would be a good way to start. Uh, how can we improve our brains on a nutritional level so that it optimizes quickly? That is a question for another live stream. I take a lot of nootropics, about 50 of them. Um, some of them have to do with staying as, uh, keeping my brain as young as possible. Some of them have to do with uh, counteracting some of the ADD medication I've taken. Um, some deal with uh, functioning at my best right now. So like no tropics. Definitely um, have a lot to say about that. Don't know how much I want to go into that right now, only because um, it opens up a can of worms. Um, so there's definitely that. I'm looking for something else here that I wanted to share. Um, I would say that um, let's see here. I would say that um, of all the things that uh, that we've talked about today, the one thing that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about, although probably is as incredibly important, is um, is recognizing that you will consistently take the path of least resistance. So setting up your life so that the path of least resistance is actually the best path is a game changer. Uh, that, and that's part of that same process of outthinking your flaws, of building a business around who you really are. It's this self-awareness, right, allows us to kind of play at a much better level than without self-awareness. And so, um, so how can you design your life so that the easiest thing to do is the right thing? That's a big question that you should all strongly think about after this live stream. So, uh, Bailey wants to know, where do I get my ideas for books to read? 
Um, I get them from a bunch of different places. Um, one from anything I'm currently working on that I'm trying to improve, right? And then two, um, whenever I come across a book list, I save that to everyone. So I have books to read and I have like just lots of different articles about books to read. Sometimes I'm reading a book because it is, uh, you know, I read in an article about Elon Musk that it's his favorite book or something like that. Other times it's because it was mentioned in a bibliography. Um, other times it's because it just looks interesting. So I jump around a lot. Um, but, and I'm, I have no problem stopping a book if I'm not getting anything out of it, which I think is really important. I'm also thinking maybe that these, uh, these live streams shouldn't be two hours. Maybe they should be one hour or an hour and a half, since it seems like I hit this period of time where if there's not a lot of questions um, and I'm not really comfortable necessarily going too much further because I believe that, um, I believe that uh, there's a benefit to letting some things sit until the next time. Uh, but I'd be glad to answer any questions if you have them as it relates to learning, as it relates to kind of creating your own learning workflow. Uh, if not, um, we'll take this further next week, you know, I mean, not next week, on Thursday, um, where I will give you more of a model of how to actually uh, be more strategic about your learning process because I think most people aren't. Um, but by all means, if you have a learning question, I would love to hear it. Uh, sometimes I feel guilty spending so much time consuming info. How much time do you think we should spend learning versus doing on a daily basis? Um, well, it depends on what your role is, obviously, right? And I would say that um, there is a proper ratio. I think it depends on what you do, right? Um, and I've never really thought about what those ratios are, but there should be more doing than inputting, I would imagine, um, for pretty much every role. So that would be a good place to start, sure. Uh, thanks, Rich, for that, because I'm looking at how I can do this faster and better than before. I really want to move to a higher level with what I do. Cool. Um, how often do you use tools like Flying Logic or doing things like the current reality tree? Um, not as often as you would think. Uh, those are theory of constraints tools. Um, I kind of jump in and out of them, uh, John. But when I'm struggling with a problem, I will often uh, use a current reality tree. That's generally my go-to move for sure. I'd be interested in knowing how to improve the formulation of concepts. Cool. Okay. Well, we're, we'll talk about that for sure, because I like to come up with theories. Part of my brain is always looking for principles and things of that nature. And so uh, I definitely will be moving to sharing more of that as well. Uh, related to learning, I hope, and read your background in hypnosis. I work with a respected Bandler trained hypnotist would be integrating Integrating hypno sessions with online course curriculum help not only the success with students and their learning, but also increase lifetime value of the course creators and a unique mechanism presently not offered by course creators. Could the services of a talented hypnotist be a viable pitch to successful online course creators? If so, what type of teaching subjects might work best with hypno integration, stating language, music instruments, etc.? Um, great question, Bruce. Uh, yes, I think that hypnosis could certainly augment. Um, bunch of stuff out there. Um, I think people in the dating niche have used it quite a bit, I think. Um, I would say that um, anything that requires behavior change would probably be useful, especially if there's um, any kind of behavior that might be uncomfortable to take. So when I had my hypnosis centers, I was, I, I was talking to Wayne Dyer and because uh, I and I actually spoke to a few people other than Wayne, but um, I was talking to him because I wanted to take erroneous zones and turn it into a hypnosis course where people could just naturally incorporate those. Um, but he was far past erroneous zones at that point in his life. Um, so there's, uh, so he wasn't so much interested in going backwards as going forwards. But I think that um, any place where people struggle uh 
is where hypnosis could be really viable and helpful. So I think from that standpoint, it would be useful, Bruce. So uh, anything else, guys? Because if not, we'll end early and um, I'm getting thrown out of my house today and I have no place to go. Uh, so I have to secure my uh, home environment for the next 24 hours. I'm in Manhattan, as I said. Um, I wish you guys could see the background, but you can't. Um, all right, so uh, we'll end here. We'll end early, uh, I think, unless someone's got some great learning questions. And uh, if so, we can talk about it. If not, um, I'd really like to learn more about finding your constraints so I can work on past them and improve abilities. Um, cool. All right. Um, well, Don, the first thing I would say is, is that Well, what I would say, Don, is if you can find a demo copy of Flying Logic, get their uh, get their get their uh, their instruction guide. It goes over a current reality tree. There's a lot of benefits to it. Um, basically, it was kind of what I was talking about. You know, you have your current business, you have your business when it's finished or ideal. Why is not your current business that? You come up with a bunch of reasons. Those reasons, then you start asking why you know and uh what you should see is what's called the convergence of cause that as you go deeper into whys the number of causes decrease because they're becoming um more entangled and in general you will find that there are a few constraints that are really kind of uh controlling the system that's the uh that's the easier way if you want to really um really go deep, you can read the book Logical Thinking Processes by William Detmer, uh, which is a great, great book, um, and probably one of the best books on learning theory of constraints as far as the logical thinking tools. Uh, Eddie, hey Rich, how you doing? Friend, love the stream. Question, how soon after learning something new, try to physically apply it on some level, and do you have a spaced repetition strategy for hitting one more time? Um, yeah, I constantly do. That's part of the Evernote process, right? Constantly revisiting, plus speed reading. Also, I'm reviewing, and um, as soon as possible, really. Um, generally, I'm working on stuff right before I release it, so it's generally that quick. Um, oh, good question. No, I still use mind mapping, but not, yeah, but I don't use it for storage anymore. I use it for like making connections, but not for storing old information. I used to use mind maps. Um, I find Evernote is much better um, for that. Yeah, well, you, uh, cool. I'm glad you uh, read that book. Uh, yeah, uh, I spoke to him a bunch of times at the Theory of Constraints conferences. Uh, any thoughts on why you, you should learn a second language to be able to give professional speeches in this language? No, and I don't know that. Uh, my, my brain doesn't work well for languages, so. Uh, I never have gotten deep with that. So, all right, well, those are the questions. Those are my answers. Uh, a shorter live session than normal, but um, with that said, I will talk to everyone on Thursday. And on Thursday, we're gonna take what we've learned these first two about learning workflows, future self, and we're gonna take it further now. Now, like we've got some grounding, I can take you into more advanced learning strategies, concepts of like how you can now multiply this. So with that said, I'll see you on Thursday to higher profits and beyond. This is Rich Sheffrin over now.